Greetings and welcome everyone to this week's Building Power. I am your host, uh, Sister Zakia Sankara Jabbar. Uh, and today I am joined uh, by Reverend Dr. Uh, Heber Brown. I'm excited um, to have this conversation uh, with you uh, today, Dr. Brown. Welcome uh, to Building Power. Um, in, in the audience, make sure you guys uh, like the video and share it. This is gonna be a, um, a very good conversation today. Um, about education, about agriculture, about all the the things uh, that 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 Dr. Brown uh, is doing so well uh, in Baltimore. Dr. Brown, welcome. Uh, please introduce yourself to our audience. Yes, thank you so much for the invitation. I've been looking forward to this conversation. I think this might be the first like in-depth conversation we've ever had, even though I've been following your work, your husband's work even before y'all were in this area. So I'm really yep. grateful to be here and to share with you. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Heber Brown. I'm the pastor of the Pleasant Hope Baptist Church here in Baltimore. I've been right. pastoring here now for 13 years. And in addition to pastoring this church, I also uh, have founded and co-founded um, a couple of organizations that we'll get into, Aritas Cross Freedom School. Yes. And the Black Church Food Security Network. Um, but yeah, I've been uh, involved in activism and organizing here in the city of Baltimore for a great number of years. And I had the privilege and good fortune of learning from so many others uh, in this city. As you know, yes. Baltimore is a rich activism and organizing kind of city. Yes. And so I've got a lot of teachers around here and I'm grateful for the opportunity to believe in my unique uh, print uh, in the midst of all the great things that others are doing. Yes. And we titled this broadcast. We um, actually uh, picked it up from you from your website, you know, critique what is wrong with Bill. I believe the Bill, what is better? There's something like that. Yeah, that, yeah. That, critique that, what is, create what should be. Create what should be. That is exactly right. And, you know, that reminded me. So, I, you know, a lot, a lot of other black folks. I grew up in church. I actually had a um a hodgepodge of, of an experience because I have a range of different um, faiths in my family. And um, in the 80s, I grew up um, with family. I did not uh, spend time with my, my parents. Unfortunately, they were impacted by the so-called war on drugs and the crack epidemic that flooded our cities in the early 80s. But I was one of those children who had to go and live with family. And I remember uh, attending church uh, as a young girl. I attended African Methodist Episcopal Church. That's the, that's where I spent most of my time. But I also spent a little time in Jehovah Witnesses, Catholic Church. Like I said, it, it runs the gamut. And it, I'm serious. And um, one of the things, even though I, I don't necessarily practice organized uh, religion now, my husband is Muslim and I support him in that. Mm -hmm. um, he's he's uh, NOI, actually. And so... Um, I still am am very supportive of anybody, you know, in my family, and I and I actually um, prefer and follow and support um, pastors like yourself who have a, a, in my opinion, what I believe is a black theology um, that meets that literally um, that that literally is the hands and feet of Jesus. That's one of the things that I remember from Sunday mm -hmm. school. Yeah. That thing, the hands and feet of Jesus. And I was telling my husband last night when I was telling him you were going to be my guest, I said, you know, he reminds me, he's like the greatest example of actually being the hands and feet of Jesus. Meaning, yeah. you know, fo following your work like this, like you, you're doing it, you know, like not just talking about it from the pulpit, but all of the connections, you know, that you have throughout the community, how you open the church up to community organizations to have meetings and things like that, I think is is remarkable. Mm. To that end, my, my, my first question, because we're an education podcast and I highly uh, support and believe in African centered uh, education and schooling. I have also been paying attention to the work that you've been doing with Aritas Cross. And I noticed like you guys follow like the, the Baltimore uh, City School schedule. Anytime the school is out, you guys are open. Mm -hmm. Can you share 
um, a little bit about that ministry, how you got started, right? Like, you know, what, what was the fire that was burning in you? What was the need that you saw that you said, we have to do this? Absolutely. Um, when I came to pastor this church in 2008, mm -hmm. one of the things that I noticed, you mentioned Sunday school. <laughs> and one of the things that I noticed when I got here was that the, the Sunday school program was not doing well at all. Mm. Uh, ch children were not coming. Parents weren't bringing them. There was low morale amongst the teachers and superintendents and others who were involved with Sunday school. It, it was not on a upward trajectory. Right. And one of the things that I had a hunch about was that one of the factors that impacted the condition of Sunday school was that it did not would involve the content. It did not involve enough content in my estimation that really helped to instill a racial self-esteem mm -hmm. and, and a pride in who I am. I mean, so there was there was no shortage of material the, that was utilized in Sunday schools that were talking about how to get to heaven. You know, you, if you, if you want to go to heaven, you got to do this, 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 this. Right, right. It, a whole lot about okay what about on earth though like I, you know <laughs> <laughs> um and then what about this beautiful brown skin that i have does god right. have anything to say about that and so right. i was so intrigued by the question of the what was going on with our sunday school that i actually went back to school i got a um, i went to a doctor of ministry program and i made the focus of my doctoral program Sunday school mm. and what could happen if we remix Sunday school and transform it into more of a freedom school. Yes. And many of those who follow you, they are familiar with the tradition and legacies of freedom schools during the 20th century. That's right. Uh, particularly during the fifties and the sixties and the organizing happening there during the uh, black freedom struggle. Uh, freedom schools were common. There were, there were, strategic uh, ways to not only convey information, but to create safe space for strategizing, to create mm -hmm. safe space to, uh, for asset-based uh, community development, skill building, et cetera. So I was like, hmm, I like that. Right. And then I saw in other settings that I've been a part of, just the gift of what happens when someone is reminded of their own uh, special and unique standing in the face of the Almighty. That you, you know, you are somebody, and nothing about you is coincidental. The the texture of your hair, the width of your nose, your yeah, all of that is by uh, intentional design. Right. I was like, hmm. All right. Let's put that freedom school uh, tradition together with that racial pride tradition and importance together with the spiritual formation. Let's put it in the pot like gumbo and let's yes. see what we create so that no part of me is left wanting um, because of a Sunday school experience. And so that's what we did. So Arita's Cross Freedom School comes out of that experience. Arita is a West African Yoruba word. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, it means where the ways come together. It means uh, intersection. And um, it's a place where one of the uh, Orisha, uh, Alegba, is the Orisha of the intersection, one that you would engage when you're trying to determine which way to go or what to do in the face of multiple choices. And I felt like it was a word that could speak very well to what we were trying to do here, meeting people at the intersection. Right. Choices, options, yes, but also the intersections of my spiritual formation, the intersections of my socio-political standing in the world and how right. I'm impacted by the isms of society, all of that together. And so it's multidisciplinary, it's uh, interactive, it's in some ways spontaneous and also very much so rooted in the traditions of popular education um, that, uh, that helps to kind of color and characterize what a Reach's Cross is. That's beautiful. And, you know, like I said, I've been following it for a while. I haven't had an opportunity um, to attend or have my children um, attend. We looked at it uh, not last summer because it was COVID, but I believe it was the 
the summer um, before that? Because you all do a summer school. Summer schools. Yeah. Uh, spring break. Yeah. Spring break. I noticed, like I said, every time it's out, you know, you guys are in and I look at like some of the activities. It's beautiful. Um, have you have you all done any and it's fine if you haven't, but do you all like the students that you have access to? Do you all also um, sort of look at any kind of data, like whether those those particular students who attend um, or reach across during the summer or on spring break, do they tend to do better um, in, in regular school uh, versus, you know, the other students who who have not attended your program? Sure. We've done a little bit in the way of more qualitative okay. studies and so or, or feedback. And so having parents fill out surveys or even yeah. the themselves gives up, give us feedback. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of that. Um, I love the idea of, of something around the longitudinal type of study to really just see. You know, I've read some of those some of that research for other cities and other programs. And I'm curious about what that could look like here. Uh, we don't have that quite yet, but in terms of qualitative, absolutely, parents and and the young people have told us that you know they feel more confident, they are sh more sure of themselves. They love the uh, one of the young people I remember telling us he loved the fact that all the age groups learn together, and so that that very communal kind of sense of what we do is there. And then in terms of people from the community, it's like. Everybody from the grandmothers on the stoop out front to the business owner, the owner down the street to whomever, like we really honor the fact that everybody has something to teach and we have something to learn from them. And so we got some of that feedback. And I think some of the best feedback I've heard from a number of our families um, kind of gets summed up in a statement that goes something like, Pastor Brown, can this be an everyday school? Can I just go here every day? And whenever I hear that was going to be my next question, actually, <laughs> go hop right into it. Yeah, <laughs> we we hear that and we've heard it for years uh, as a kid. We've heard it for years. Right. And I'm, I'm glad to hear it. And I know also how I know how serious that is. I know how weighty. I mean, I remember when our children were younger, we thought long and hard about where to send them to school. And like that's no light decision. And so. I want to make sure that when we do step out in that direction, that the foundation is very strong, the support is in place, the financial resources will help us with sustainability uh, and for the long haul. So I just want to make sure all the ducks are in a row before we step out there. But I'm grateful that we have the um, the support of our community and our base families to go ahead and make that step. And I see it within reach. I mean, it's not going to be tomorrow or anything, but I think one of the one of the things that this pandemic has done is has really pushed a lot of us to give more thought to co-creating the kinds of systems and institutions and structures that we need for ourselves. And so I could see it within the near horizon that we'll be ready to step forward. I think the next step is going to be an everyday after school program and then perhaps a Saturday academy. And then next step would be every. I just want to really stagger it well so that. You know, That's I, smart. me and you, we've been around enough. You've organized long enough. You know, right. the beginning, the energy is there. The enthusiasm is there. But the weight of new projects and initiatives can sometimes fizzle stuff out and you lose your way. So I just want to be very strategic with that. That is so true. And it's and, and um, it reminds me of another conversation where uh, I, I was preparing for this today. And I asked my husband, I was like, well, um, do you do you have any suggestions of questions I should ask Dr. Brown? He yeah. said, you know, he reminded me I don't know how I forgot about it. I, I didn't really forget about it, but he brought it back to my attention uh -huh. that when we were still in Dayton, Ohio, um, we launched. Uh, it was really my husband. He he carried the f almost a full weight of that. And I, I just supported him in that. But we launched the Saturday school uh, in the summer. Uh, wow. there, African Center Saturday School. And we did it um, similar to you where we just networked in community. We had a, a building where we worked um, with the McClendon Institute, which was in at, in Dayton at the time was a private African Center School. Okay. Um, it's called the McClendon Institute. 
uh, Mama Renee, uh, who, who runs that place, um, did not have the school functioning at that time for similar reasons, you know, like it, just the weight of it, fi sustainability, all of those things. But anyway, so fight to today, she opened it up for us to use the building and charge us in it a, a wow. thing and, and, and supported us because she is a master teacher. Mm. And so I say all that to, and it was highly successful. That's why it, as an organizer, particularly in education justice, I, I go off yeah. when I hear people say that black people or poor and working class black people don't care about education. When I tell you that community in Dayton and West Dayton, particularly, it's kind of like Baltimore in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of black poverty. There is certainly a lot of um, systemic violence where, you know, the systems and institutions and policymakers and politicians have forgotten uh, right. about the community and all of that good stuff. Right. But the people of the community. When we said we were doing that, they people pulled together they two or three dollars and fifty dollars here, here, here's help. And people helped to get children there. And I, I didn't know how hard it was at the time, but Hashem reminded me this morning, he said, you know, we did that for the summer. And he said that was a lot. It was exhausting. He was like, I enjoyed it. The children, the parents were like they wanted it to continue similarly. But he said, can you ask him how 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 can what what were some of the pro, what are some of the challenges even now? Right. Running the school, because it, it is a lot. You know, what are some of the challenges? How do you work to overcome them? And then, you know, on the on the on the end, how do you sustain it? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's a I, lot. I know <laughs> it, it's a lot, but it's so on point. That's such a great question, because I think it's something that particularly for those who are watching who may be, you know, have similar ideas or they're organizing in similar ways right now. Um, I think one of the things that comes first to mind is connected to what I just said, like really being honest about your capacity. And I'm a dreamer. Right. I, I get these visions. I get these dreams. Uh, like like you said, that quote, if I had a tattoo, it'd be across my chest. It would say, critique what is, create what should be. It'd be right across my chest like Tupac. Um, and so these big visions get really sharp in my mind about how things can look. And I had to learn over the years that that's a wonderful thing to have in terms of the vision. But you also have to be honest about what do you have the capacity to do right now? And not just to do, but to, to, to do well and consistently. What do you have now? Right. So that was that is something that I've had to learn the hard way because I get an idea. And the next day I'm like, yo, we're going to do this. Y'all come on. And then for a hot minute, we rolling with it. Right. But then when life happens and life always happens, when it happens, then it's like, wait a minute. What happened was and then the program is off to the side. And so. I would say being honest about capacity is very, very important. And sometimes we need people around us who can pull us down to the ground a little bit and be like, all right, I'm rocking with you. We here. And here are the baby steps to get to where it is you're saying you want to go. And so that's important. I think, too, um, you know, and this kind of lands centrally in terms of where uh, the context of my organizing. I am very intentionally organizing in black church spaces uh, because it provides many of the basic ingredients that I need uh, to do the things that I'm doing. So like this sanctuary right here that I'm sitting in, I had to go find like, thankfully, y'all had mama was a mama Renee. Y'all had mama Renee yeah. with a building. Right. Right. But a whole lot of other groups that get an idea and then like the like the, the the bolts, the nuts and bolts of how right. you, how you going to operate it. You need a space. Right. Um, you need, to, you know, if you're going to do field trips, you need vehicles. Yeah. If you're going to eat, you need a kitchen or someplace where you can get food prepared. Right. So right. for me, black church organizing in black churches. And I'm later this year, I'm planning a black church organizing training program. Amazing. Because from the church bus right outside this door, that was our field trip bus the kitchen right in that room over there that's where breakfast and lunch was prepared this space is for our assemblies and learning the garden outside was the, a classroom 
Uh, the, wow. So it's like utilizing what is already here. And then for us, recognizing that Monday through Saturday, all of these assets sit, sit like, in the community unused. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I'm sitting in this church right now all by myself. Right. Wow. So, oh, so and, you know, imagine all of these black church spaces. Right. They have all of it. So. You know, I, I, I'm I'm too old to argue. I don't argue with, with nobody. I don't argue. I don't argue it. I'm too old for all that. I right. I, don't, I respect where people are. Awesome. Does it work for you? Is it healthy? Is it wholesome? All right. Awesome. Right. I'm fine. Inside, I right. say, y'all don't throw away the black church because you know, yes, has some funky stuff happened in churches? Absolutely. Are there some jack leg preachers out here preaching this uh, uh, white theology and black yeah, faith? Yep. Absolutely, right? Has church hurt happened? Absolutely. All of that is true and exact and it's valid. And when I put my organizer hat on, right. I'm like, I'm not surrendering all of these physical assets right. to those, you know, those who would steer it in a direction that's not ultimately helping our people. And so for me, for everybody, it's not church. But I would say doing a clear assessment of the assets that you have in your hand. Right. And sometimes that's not always a building. It might be a living room or a front mm -hmm. porch or your side yard. That's but right. Whatever that is, I would just say, don't jump too fast, too far into saying we're going to rent out this hall down the street or we're going to buy the stadium around the like. Oh, wait a minute. Right? Right. Uh, there's a Bible scripture that says despise not the days of small beginnings. Wow. And so long before y'all were able to see or reach this cross freedom school doing what we're doing. It was me and my children in my living room and I was testing stuff up on them and that they were teaching me like that. Right. Uh -huh. That ain't cool. That ain't interesting. That's not that's not going to work. That ain't going to work. That ain't going to work. And so, you know, in this culture where we're so quick to put stuff online and we want to show people that, we, you know, you know, I, I think there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen behind the scenes and offline and in the analog world before you take it to the digital and vir virtual world. Um, I completely agree with that. That I mean, because yeah, everything is moving so more, more, much more technological, even school, right? Like everything is, is, and I, I believe that there are some things that are done better. Like you said, still in the analog world, still in person. And, and I think for us, I will say that we are very a communal people. Like we, we like being together in community. Um, and, and that's, that has been, um, my experience, at least in, in organizing. I wanted to go back to something that you said, um, uh, just a few minutes ago. And I, I, I know from my organized experience that you are absolutely right. I am, um, mature enough to admit that one of my deficiencies as an organizer is that I, at the time, uh, in Ohio, did not have good working relationships with the church. Mm. And that um, was actually a, a part of, I believe, uh, some of the things that we could have done a lot better with, mm. you know, in terms of reaching our people. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Dayton is, is, is one of those cities where if you're going to get anything done politically for black people, yeah. you do have to go through the church. Yeah. You, you you really do because the politicians do every time it's time for an election they run it around to every big black <laughs> church in West Dayton and I saw that I'm like wait a minute right what right you doing? <laughs> you know? I was like but they knew you know what I mean like they you know like you said they did the assessment of yeah. like the power for black people at least in Dayton it's not true everywhere right yeah. I would say like where I'm at now that's not necessarily true uh, yeah. here in Silver Spring and and the the black population here is also much more diverse in terms of where people are actually from in fact I think being a um, black American for me here in Montgomery County in Silver Spring we're the minority wow. <laughs> right yeah like because most of, I'm I'm serious like all the like even my neighborhood like um, I don't think except for one neighbor uh, most of the other black people that live in our neighborhood are either from the continent or from the Caribbean wow yeah okay. yeah That's so that was a culture family. shock 
yeah. when we moved here. In fact, I, I remember because, you know, we wear our African center clothes. As one sister, Ethiopian sister, came up to me at my daughter's school and she started speaking in Amharic because she thought I was Ethiopian. She was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, like, no. <laughs> she said, oh, I looked at your shirt. She said, that's the colors of our flag. And I was just like, wow. <laughs> you know, so it's it's been a very, very interesting experience, but you're right. And and I'm mature enough to admit, you know, in a lot of places and, and especially in the South, I feel like this came up during the uh, primary election last year. Like you have to know how to talk to black people culturally in certain yeah. places in this country. You have to know what makes them tick. You have to know like what they vibe with basically. Mm. And and I think that what you're doing is absolutely brilliant. Mm. Um because in order to really reach the masses of our people, whether uh, the conscious folks like me like it or not, yeah. a lot of our people are still very much attached to the Christian church. Yeah. Um and 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 that's the the majority faith system for our people, whether we like it or not. Yeah, and I think too, I mean you you you're so right matter of fact uh, I might need you to be a part of this uh, training thing I'm doing later this year. This okay, black call church. me. Yeah, we have to set it up the black church organizing piece because you know just any every organizer and and I'm saying church and we're talking about church now, but it could be other spaces. But it's like where are the group of organized people? Where mm -hmm. are they in where, church? Where, yeah, where do they organize? Every Sunday. That's where do you know? So. Uh, you may not walk into every church and they're talking about, you know, cooperative economics and going down the no. of principles. Right. But if you walk in and you have eyes to see it, many churches are living, even unconsciously, living or leaning in the direction of the Kwanzaa principles or right. or, uh, or my arts or in some kind of way, even right. unconsciously. And so it's like, all right. So if, if the people are organized here, mm -hmm. if they organize their assets in this place, and if they have created some type of system that furthers their vision of what their society should, you know, their vision of society should look like, right. how do I come alongside that in such a way that I honor that, I connect and link with that in ways that make sense and that are healthy for me, and that I can help to influence and may plant a seed so that this this 80 year old church, this 100 year old institution wow. that has found a way to survive cross burnings, that's right. Of their pastor, like, like they put the money together to bury Big Mama. They, you know, we have the largest. You get me excited, yeah, I'm sorry, but like, no, no, this is good. When I think about the largest collective land owner in Black America is the Black Church community. <laughs> Wow. And we know what Malcolm X said about land. We know what France Fanon said about land. We know right. like we know is land is the key to furthering and deepening your revolutionary ideals. So I'm like, where is that? The right. churches have that. And also, I'm not so I don't have such blinders on that I don't recognize that it, it does show up in other pockets and places, some of these characteristics. So even with street organizations, so-called right. gangs. So-called gangs, yeah. Street organizations. They are people who organized around a set of principles. They, they uh, collect their assets together. They enforce their vision of what the world should be, like right. sororities or fraternities. Like uh, so, just from an organizer standpoint, asking even as like the corner or the gas station, the, the hustle right. or whatever. It's like where are black people organizing themselves? Yes. And what are they already doing that could have some utility? toward furthering the black freedom struggle and liberatory dreams where they are. And that's a good segue mm -hmm. um, because you are one of the few pastors that I know of, I will say personally, I know that there's others like on the West Coast that's doing some things that are similar to you. And I know you probably know of mm -hmm. probably hundreds of others that we don't necessarily get a chance to see on social media or like mainstream media. But I, I knew that at the time living in Dayton, I did not have the example of mm -hmm. um, what you're doing in terms of Aretas Cross actually having um, a, a, a school that is rooted in who we are as a people, right? African history and promoting hands-on learning. Yes. But the Black Church Food Security Network. Yes. When I tell you I was blown away, I have an opportunity to tell you that now to you. But I was blown away when you launched that because I'm like, yeah, not just you, all, all of us are conscious people. You know, I think about like John Henry Clark. He was like 
you know, we can, we're not doing it. We don't provide anything for ourselves. We don't control our food. We don't make our clothes. I mean, he just broke it down. And mm. now one of the, the things that we know we cannot live without, which is nourishment and food, um, you have taken it upon yourself to build this network. To, to, to promote food equity and also, like you said, using the institutions, I believe the black church is still one, I will say at least one of the um, biggest institutions within the black community here in the United States. But please talk to us a little bit about that vision. I mean, I, I heard you talk about these big ideas, but you have, at least from what I can see, have been pretty successful in the launch of this black church food security network. Yeah, it's, it's been amazing. And I can't even talk about it without lifting up the ancestors who, who've laid the path and still guide us to this day. So I got to speak the names of people like uh, Reverend Vernon Johns, who um, who preceded uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Alabama. Wow. He was like the OG pastor of his time that MLK Jr. and uh, the other young preachers looked up to Reverend Vernon Johns, and this is like the mid fifties, Reverend mm -hmm. Vernon Johns was preaching a message during one of the, the high times of black folk migrating from the South to the North and the West. And Reverend Vernon Johns was like, yo, everybody's not going North and everybody's not going West. That's right. Some of us are staying in the South. How can we bri build bridges between North and the South uh, so that the land that we have down here can connect with the markets that you are walking into up there mm. and can provide for our own needs. Reverend Vernon Johns was saying this in the 1950s. He was wow. like, we are land rich down here, but cash poor. Y'all are up there with greater access to yeah, that's right. <laughs> but you're in these concrete jungles and Jungle. you ain't got no land. Yeah, so let's link it up together and create our own supply chain so we can feed each other, take care of one another and be more independent and autonomous. So he said it. I got a shout out. Uh, Reverend Albert Clegg, Jr. Yes. Pride of the Black Madonna. Yes. Um, Pan-African Orthodox Christian uh, Church like that. Reverend Albert Clegg, Jr. was saying the same thing. He was yes. saying. We need to feed ourselves. Whoever feeds the people controls the people. And That's right. The freedom School is uh, who, whoever, uh, whoever controls the food controls the people. It's a song that we sing. I have the baby singing it. Whoever oh. controls the food controls the people, the people. We sing that song together because I want these six, seven and eight year olds to get it in their head that they have to control their plate to a greater degree than the society uh, allows us to. So, but in terms, so Reverend Albert Clegg Jr., Reverend Vernon Johns, Fannie Lou Hamer. Yes. Fannie Lou Hamer in Sunflower County, Mississippi, with the Freedom Farm Cooperative, was bringing working class black folks together to grow food together and learn other skills like, or, or not learn them, but to be more strategic with the skills they knew how to do, like sewing and the like. Like mm -hmm. if we work together and start a sewing co-op, we can do far better than having, you know, individually trying to go out and make it on our own. Fannie Lou Hamer was amazing. She was brilliant. And, and there's so many more I can name, but all of these ancestors have been very present with me to help point the way with respect to what does it look like to take the best and the heart and the meat of those traditions and bring it to our time. And as I studied their examples in their lives and listened to their voices and followed the urge of their spirit, I saw the opportunity to once again, anchor a food system in the bosom of the black church. Mm. Because as you remember, in all the churches and stuff you went to, food is everywhere in the picture. Everywhere. It's everywhere. Somebody's born, you eat. Somebody died, you eat. Somebody get married, you eat. Food's always here, right? Always. I was like, hmm. How can we at this church get a greater control over um, our food environment? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, let's start, start start growing food on the little bit of land that we have. So that's how it started in, uh, in 2010. We started growing food. Word of mouth started moving and talking about our garden. We started hearing from others. I was learning from others as well who also were doing some amazing things. And I got to the place where I began to say, how can we systematize what we're experiencing at this one church? So if this one black church was able to grow 
1,200 pounds of food, of produce a year on 1,500 square feet. Wow. We got 100, Sakia, we got 150 or so, 150, 175 members. So we ain't no, we do mega ministry, but we're not mega church in the way that people think about mega church. You've been sure, there. Sure, yeah, I've been there, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a plus because most black churches in the country are not the big megas. That's right. Most of them are like this when I'm sitting in. That's where right. you got one or two full-time staff, you got 150, 200, maybe 300 members or so, you got a little bit of land. So I was like, if we can figure out how to feed ourselves with the profile of congregation that we are, it becomes a blueprint that other black churches can utilize. Yes. I was like, let's stitch together uh, our operations so we can systematize this food experience. So basically in a nutshell, what we do is we help black churches to start gardens um, or environmental projects on land that they own. Wow. And we don't fool with like, like city owned lots and that kind of stuff because they can always take it away from people. They can take it away, yeah. We, we, we see that time and time again. So I'm like, no, we start with black church owned land to help you start a garden. And we know that you're not gonna feed, you know, your whole community off a garden, but it's a demonstration site. When you get your hands in that soil and you start seeing what's possible with just a little bit, it can sometimes help to shake the shackles off people's minds to say, oh, we can feed ourselves like our big mamas and them did. Yes. So we help you start. We help churches start gardens. That's called Operation Higher Ground. OK. And then we have something called the Soil to Sanctuary Market, where wow. we do miniature farmers markets inside churches on the days when they worship. Wow. We bring the farmers and black business owners inside the church because we recognize that one of the first things that black folk do after church is what? Eat. <laughs> Eat. Listen, if the restaurants in black neighborhoods be packed on Sunday after church. Right. right. People be racing after the benediction to go get your seat because you know everybody going over there. So I'm like, hmm. It's our tradition. Study, that's our tradition and studying that behavior. Let us then... Um, Let's put the food in the church before they leave mm -hmm. with the black farmers right there at the door. And so that's our soil to sanctuary market. Um, and we're excited about that coming back into play now, uh, now that, you know, things it's are COVID, yeah. yeah, 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 yep. Yeah. And then the final thing, one of the pivots that we made during this pan pandemic was we called it the BCSA, Black Church Supported Agriculture Program. Mm -hmm. And with our BCSA program, You've seen churches doing like the food boxes and giving food out to the community yes. over the past year. Well, a lot of the produce in those boxes does not come from black farmers. Hmm. So black farmers are not getting the contracts to provide produce for black people. So you can have black churches getting produce from white farmers to give it to black people. And those farmers are getting contracts from corporations, the USDA and whoever else. What wow. we decided to do was create our own food distribution program that include that only had black farmers providing the produce and had black churches paying them wholesale prices for what they provide. And then what our organization does is we just do logistics and administration. So I get on a truck, go down and pick up produce. Now our staff is doing that more and more or we help the churches. Just, we help the farmers and the churches come together and we try to be the glue to help keep them together as well. So that's the Black Church Food Security Network. We are as far west as Omaha, Nebraska, up and down the East Coast. We're launching a new chapter um, in uh, the Southeast uh, next year. And so I'm really excited because as you know, wherever black folks are, black churches are not far away. So it's like we got satellite locations potentially all over the country. So why not see about ways to bring all this together in support of one of the basic needs? I mean, for everybody from our Neely Fuller uh, with the nine areas of people activity to uh, Dr. Amos Wilson with the black. Every all the texts that I read. Right. They talk about the basic things that we need just to survive and be alive. Yes. All I'm trying to do is in the space where I am bend the strength and institutional power and resources and direction of man of helping to take care of those basic fundamental needs that we have, whether you go to Jehovah's Witness, whether That's you're right. Catholic, whether you're Muslim, whether you, whatever it is. And speaking of ancestors and speaking of models, I cannot end by uh, without also acknowledging the nation of Islam. That's right. 
have to acknowledge uh, the Nation of Islam, have to acknowledge their example, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, his writings on eating to live, like all of the yeah. stuff, like we think this stuff is brand new. For, like, no, no, this was happening. And following their example in the Nation of Islam as well has been helpful. I'll tell you that um, the Mormons have a food system of their own. I didn't know that about the Mormons. Yes. Wow. I, I learned about it last year. They got a whole food system. They have almost like supply cities. They got storage of their grains and their rices and of course their rice and their beans. And of course, the nation of Islam has a lot of that too. Also yeah. in Judaism, that's they like I'm once I started studying Zaki, I'm like, everybody got it but the black church. But like, wait a minute. Yeah, this is especially so in the southeast. It is common. They have it. So I'm like, all right. Well, it's our turn to go ahead and bring this forward as well. Yeah, yeah. This is this is some pictures from your uh, Black Church oh. Network Instagram. It's amazing. Um, yeah. I, oh, yeah. That, I saw that one. That one was recent. You know, I'm, I am um, just so I I was looking at the website earlier, and I saw that you guys are also. I guess are you in Texas as well, or on we your have, own way? We have member congregations down there. Who okay. have reached out and said, I want to join and be a part. So we're with all the churches in our network, we're at different points of organizing with them to kind of hear what it is that they're interested in. Because we always want to honor what local churches and local people are saying. Absolutely. So if they say pastor, we want a garden. That's where we focus. If they say pastor, we want a market. That's where we focus. Now we'll get to the other stuff eventually, but we eventually yeah. to honor where people are. So we do have a couple in Texas as well. That's amazing. Um, I have to ask this and, and, and you know, just be as honest as possible. How ha, share, I guess, a little bit for people who because I'm looking at some of the comments, some of the people here are like, oh, I'm sharing this with my church as sister here um, with her church. I'm not sure where she is. Um, but for for other pastors or people who are watching. Right. And, you know, if they're even like members of certain churches. What, how could they contact you if they wanted to end up being a part of it? And also, what are some of the challenges across like the nomination? Because I'm, I'm thinking about like the differences also in the theology and all of that, if you, if you want to share. Sure, sure. Can you hear me? I think my technology. No, I can hear you. Okay, good. Okay. Um, yeah. So if you want to connect with us, yeah, send us an email, info at blackchurchfoodsecurity.net info at blackchurchfoodsecurity.net. Our team will get your message and we'll begin working with you around how we can connect together. Uh, one of the first things that I wanna do, once you complete some, some simple paperwork for us, one of the first things I wanna do is we'll want to meet with you and at least three to five other members of your church. It's not enough to be an individual in the congregation and have an idea. So we want to we want to be sure that you already have done some work to organize your other sisters and brothers in the congregation um, before you get to us. Because what I know is the weight is real, that the excitement is there, but the weight is real. And eventually the um, your, your adrenaline is going to come down eventually. Uh, and so I want to make sure that you have the team in place. We want to make sure you have the team in place before we get started. And so that is something that we want. We want to ask. So for those of you who want to connect and you're a member of a church, I would say start talking to other people in your congregation. Talk to your pastor. Talk to the trustee chair. Talk to the, the chair of the deacon board. Like you want to you want to have some conversations and get some buy in before you get to us. So you can go start that now and then email us or call us here at the church and we'll we'll start, you know, start taking some steps with you. In terms of challenges, that's an awesome question. So some of the challenges is that um, for some churches, this is so foreign. It's foreign in a, in a congregational context to a lot of churches. It's not foreign in a family context, because if I ask you about your great grandmother or your pop pop or your auntie them, many of us have stories. In fact, we can go down the roll of people. Uh, this sister says I'm in Georgia. Right. I, and, and many, many of us will have um, roots down south, even if we're not down south anymore. And you have family land down there as well. 
So it is not, it's not foreign in terms of that, but in terms of churches, we've not seen a whole lot of models of churches that embrace this kind of way to do ministry. And so it can be a lot to try to get people to that space mentally mm -hmm. where they see this not as some extracurricular side project, but they actually see it as an expression of the hands and feet of Jesus. Jesus. As you said, I mean, think about it. Can you remember these stories from Sunday school? Oh, Jesus, Jesus feeding 5,000, right? With, That's uh, right. You remember those stories? Like, so we shout about this stuff and fall out on the floor and get all happy in the spirit. <laughs> but have we ever thought about how to systematize these sacred spiritual stories for our time? That's all this is. The Black Church Food Security Network is just our way to live the Bible in real time. It's wow. one of the ways we do that. And so I would say the, you know, it's very important to study together. I'm a strong proponent of popular education. I can tell. Read together. Study together. Learn the history. Uh, uh, Tambico, pour water and call the ancestors who did it before you did it. They'll come. Uh, God will send the angels, Orishas, and ancestors to come alongside you to help point the way for you. Uh, all those kind of things are very important. So the challenge is um, pacing yourself yeah, so that you don't just jump out there, burn out, get mad, and leave the church. This is, this is a marathon. And so slow down. Um, Get with others, study together, maybe do some small manageable test projects in your church. Uh, get some mentorship, whether it's from us or others. Um, but we have a whole slew of others in this community who are doing similar things that can be helpful. So those are things that are very, very important. And along those lines, I, I love your, the hashtag over top of my head on the screen. Building right. power. And I think a lot of churches talking about challenges, we struggle with building power. Wow. We satisfied with extending services. So I'm, we're trying to provoke churches to go from providing services to procreating systems. We got to mm -hmm. go from services to systems because we want to be sure that after we have transitioned from this place, or if life happens and we're doing something else, a transition happens, we move to a different city. If you really care about what it is that you have done where you are, you want to make sure that it continues even if you're not there. If it cannot continue in your absence, then it might not be a system. It might be mm. a powerful program. Mm. But because our oppression is systemic, our solution should be systemic as well. Wow. It should not just be wrapped up in one person's charismatic personality. We should institutionalize and systematize our liberation just as the enemies of our people institutionalize and systematize our oppression. Right. So we got to be on the same playing field and, and not just churches, but even beyond the church. People can struggle to get to the place where they systematize building power and not just have programs that provide services. Yeah, this that's it. That's um, this has been great. That's the perfect way to to wrap to wrap this conversation today. And I'm I'm grateful that you joined us, and I have to learn more uh, about all the systems that you have put in place. Um, and I'm appreciative, you know, just so grateful and and happy for the people in Baltimore who get to experience you uh, up close and, and, and personal um, every single day. Uh, where can people find you? How can people follow you? Also, how can people uh, who may not live in Baltimore, but love your ideas, love the Aretas Cross School, love the Black Food Church Network? How can people support from afar? Sure. I'll do the second one first. Look, okay. like you said. I, I'm not some anomaly, y'all. Like there's a whole community of, it's like the tradition, those who follow the tradition of Dr. Jeremiah Wright, those mm. who follow the, the tradition of, of the Baptist minister, Nat Turner, those yeah. who, like 
we are so enamored and so so hypnotized sometimes by the colonial expressions of Christianity that I don't think is real Christianity. But anyway, the colonial expression of Christianity gets so much play and so much airtime that we forget that there's a revolutionary branch and arm of this faith. And there are pastors all over the country who are doing some things very similar. So I would say to anybody who's interested and you want to align, let me help steer you to your cousin pastor in your city who needs help in their church doing stuff like this. This is not easy. And I don't care how gifted the pastor they need. Pastors need help. And yeah. so I'd rather help you steer to your, uh, whoever's in your city to help get that done or y'all can start building relationship. And in terms of myself, um, you know, I've been on a little bit of a Facebook hiatus, but I'm coming back soon. So you can find me on Facebook. Uh, I'll be back soon, y'all. Just wait in the living room. I'll be there soon enough. <laughs> then uh, Twitter, I'm more active on Twitter these days. Uh, my IG, I'm not as active, but I'm coming back to all of that. And I had to take a break. Y'all know how that is. Sometimes y'all get off. You got to. Social break. media can be overwhelming. Oh, my Lord have mercy. So, yeah, look up Heber Brown. There ain't a whole lot of Hebers. H-E-B-E-R. Find me on social media. Uh, or send me an email. My email is pastor, um, pastor at pleasanthope.org, pastor at pleasanthope.org. I'd love to connect and I'd love to learn. You know stuff I don't know. Please. I, I got my book bag right here on purpose. We have to be, all of us have to be eternal students and have to be self-critical in a healthy way so that we continue to grow. And I'm still on my growth journey. So I'd love to listen and learn from you as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Brown. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening today. Join us same place, same time next week. Next week, our guest is Dr. Tommy J. Curry, and we'll be diving into the subject of critical race theory, what it really is, not what the media is talking about. Thank you all so much. Take care, everybody. <laughs>